has many differences from Switzerland. But what is interesting is that we also have quite a few similarities. And I think this is, of course, where we could also explore where we can learn from you, or you can learn from us, or even better, where we can work together. And I think this is what, what I would like to, to talk about uh, briefly now in the f next few, few minutes. And, um, well, uh, just a, a few very brief numbers. Uh, the first number, of course, is very striking. If you look at population, we are very different, right? Uh, I guess you have uh, some of you have been to Switzerland. Uh, so we are very different in that regard. But if you look, for example, at the political system, it was mentioned uh, at the beginning, we are not that far apart. We have a national government that sets certain rules, but then even the power sector is very uh, regional. We have as we, what we call cantons. And the cantons actually, they are uh, what you have as states here, they own most of the production assets. They are also typically owning at least part of the distribution system. So we have the, local, uh, the, the um, federal government that decides on, on certain basics of the, of the energy strategy, whereas then the cantons, by owning the assets, have a very big say. So we have this discussion going on. And just to give you a, a very small uh, um, idea of what the challenges there are, uh, we have for hydropower, there are tariffs to actually use local water in, in the power um, stations. Uh, and there's a big debate going on how large these uh, tariffs can be, because it's actually the, the regional um, governments, uh, the states in your case, the cantons in our case, that mainly get this money, and the federal government or the whole population that pays for it. So we have uh, many of these, these issues as well. I think that's very uh, similar. Uh, if you look at the official languages, we have four in Switzerland. Three are the, the main ones. You have two, but of course, we all know that there are many more languages in India. So we also have these uh, barriers, of course, to, to, to overcome. Uh, I think that's also a, a similarity. And then when you go to energy, what I found, I mean, we have talked a lot about numbers. I don't want to go into the details. But if you think of Switzerland, many people in Switzerland think, well, the Swiss energy system is actually perfect because we only have nuclear and hydro. So it's, it's almost CO2 free, um, and it's very reliable, and, and so it's all fine. But then if you go into the numbers, you actually see that if you look at energy, not just electricity, we import a lot of fossil fuels, mainly gas and oil. So oil for, for mobility, mainly gas for heating. So we are dependent on imports, and uh, they are fossil. They're not coal. Uh, so that's then the, uh, leading the way to India, where in India, of course, you import a lot of coal. And this import has been increasing in, in the last decades. So we are both dependent on, on, on imports, and they're both fossil. So we have to both try to, at least that's what the Swiss government tries to do, and I guess it's very similar here in India, we try to, to be less dependent on, on foreign, um, uh, foreign imports, mainly fossil fuels, but we also, and then we have to do something within uh, the country. And when you then look at the, the energy um, challenge that we have in the future, um, of course, so I move uh, one forward, of course, well, the, the, the Swiss government just decided very recently that we ha want to be a net zero CO2 emissions country by 2050. It was a decision by the federal government. The actual um, um, implementation path is not clear yet. So we know the goal, 2050, which might seem far, but it's actually not if you're in an energy and thinking about the energy system. Uh, so we don't know how to get there. And uh, well, for India, it's a little bit different, but still, I, I guess the common goal we all share with the, with the Paris Agreement. And so um, when you look at where are these CO2 emissions coming from today, it's completely clear that the energy sector is one of the main drivers. There's also uh, um, agriculture, there's industry, but, but the energy system is very important. So if you want to get to net zero by 2050, it's completely clear that the energy system has to completely decarbonize probably well before 2050, at least when you look at the pathway. But then if you look bottom up, when you think like how fast can we change the system, you realize that's not that simple to do. So we have this contradiction that we have kind of the goal by 2050, uh, at least uh, in, in Europe and Switzerland. But then when you look at technology and, and changing the system, it's only 30 years. So that's uh, pretty tough. Um, and then at the same time, we have electricity demand increasing. You have uh, more AC here. We have more um, moving to electrification in the building sector. More and more buildings, especially the new ones, they are heated no longer by fossil fuels, but by, by heat pumps. So we're using more electricity. 
then we probably need to move to e-mobility, at least that's how it looks now. I mean, we will see in 20 years how it is, but at the moment, at least, it looks like. So, which is a good thing, because we will reduce CO2 emissions, it will increase efficiency, etc. but it means we need more electricity. So we have this, at the same time, increasing uh, demand. Uh, and then, so we, we have this whole energy sector that needs to move to net zero. In Switzerland, we have a, an additional challenge that we want to exit nuclear power. That's also a political uh, thing that is happening at the, uh, at the moment. So we e even not only have to increase electricity production, we also have to supplement uh, the system when once we got rid of our nuclear power stations, which is about uh, the same, well, actually earlier. So we have all these challenges. And how do we do it? I mean, it's completely clear, and that's again a very a similarity between India and, and, and Switzerland. We have to have more renewable energy sources. It's unclear if it, how big it needs to be, and I know India has a very uh, um, challenging um, uh, goal that has been set there. Uh, but I think it's the same thing. And when you look at the potentials of the different different sources, yes, of course, there's biomass. Yes, of course, there there uh, there's maybe geothermal in Switzerland, but it's, it's unclear. Yes, there's wind, but in all this we see both from, from a practical point of view as well as in our simulations that we are doing that PV will play the main role. At least that's how it looks like. So again, both for Switzerland and for, for, for India, we need to understand how is PV coming into the play and not just by the numbers because of course you can set goals and can say like, okay, we need to buy this many uh, panels, but to, how do you actually make a system work where you have a huge share of renewables? And it has been mentioned uh, before and I think this is, if you take all this together, this is one of the main challenges that we have. How do we make a system that is electrified? So we have electric mobility, we have in our case in, in, in Switzerland electric, uh, electrified building sector, uh, you have a huge, a big share of renewables, especially PV. Uh, you might be able to combine that with, with hydropower. That's very important in Switzerland, in India, and in certain areas of, as well. You have some nuclear, you have some wind. How do you connect that? And what is interesting, I mean, has been, uh, you have been talking about um, distribution grids. I think what is really interesting is when you combine the whole system and you have to look at the transmission level and the distribution level at the same time and how do they operate. So you have certain things that you can do on the distribution side and that's very important. You have certain things, especially a security of supply for example, that you can do on the central transmission uh, system. But how do they interact? So again, like to give you a very concrete example, when we move more into to PV, we need storage and the storage could be batteries, for example. At least that's a, a trend that we see now. We have more and more decentralized batteries, neighborhood batteries, maybe not in each house, but in neighborhood level. And these batteries, they are there to store from, the, uh, night, uh, from day to night, uh, but they also could supply services to the central system, for example, uh, um, uh, for, for stability control. So how do you interact? How does the local battery know when it has to provide power to, to the central system or, or, or um, uh, uh, auxiliary services to, to, to the central system. And when does the distribution system operator know that he can allow that or where, when does he can't? And uh, this is a, a, a thing that is also part of the smartness because quite often we talk about smart grids but when you only look at the distribution grid, which is fine. And if you have mini micro grids, that's also how, how it does work. But in, in larger areas, uh, you are connected to the grid. So we need to understand this. And if PV takes only a few percent, five, 10, maybe to 20, 30%, it's fine. You, we can go as we did before. But as soon as you higher, reach higher shares, if you go to, to uh, at least in power and during uh, certain times, when you go above 50%, it doesn't work like it did before. So there I see a huge, uh, huge challenge. And also uh, I think we need, we need uh, uh, solutions that are not here today. So that brings me to what we need today. Uh, I, I already mentioned most of it. We need the integration of renewables. We need to integrate e-mobility. We also need to look at multi-energy systems, especially in, in, in Switzerland. That's something that is being taught quite a lot but we see that coming more and more also in the future because one thing you also need to do, not only day-night storage, but also weekly storage, seasonal storage, and uh, for example, hydro, uh, hydrogen could play a role there. We don't know yet if it ever will be, will be feasible also economically. Technically, it's feasible, yes. 
So how do you integrate different energy carriers into the play? In Switzerland, there's a big discussion about the gas grids, the gas infrastructure, natural gas infrastructure. Can we use it to store energy? Technically, it's possible, yes. But does it make sense in a system point of view? Does it make sense economically? This is completely unclear. And there are many things going on there that is beyond the, the, the state of the art today. Storage I already mentioned. And in terms of technology, uh, a lot of things are already there. So we don't need the killer technology. Most of the things are there. We have storage. We have, well, not seasonal, but we have uh, short-term storage. We have PV. We have wind. We have the system that works today. So many things are there, but it's really the integration. And then there are a couple of things that we don't have, and uh, I mentioned seasonal storage before. If you go into the mobility sector, we don't have synthetic fuels, and there are some applications where electric mo mobility doesn't make sense, and aviation is one of them. Uh, I, I think we will take, uh, we won't fly with, with batteries even, even in the next 20, 30 years, so we need something there. We don't know yet what it is. Also cargo, if you take ships, if you take uh, trains, if you take uh, um, uh, also um, uh, other modes of transportation, there it's also not clear yet. Will it be hydrogen? Will it be other means? This is also a big challenge and, and sometimes forgotten because we all look at the electricity, but uh, if we look at the overall energy consumption, this is an important part and it needs to be done. And so I think it, it's, for me, like kind of like uh, looking everything together, uh, it's really on one side the tools, how to connect everything that we need. We need modeling tools that both look at distribution system and also on transmission level. And we also need to connect that to climate models because this is something that more and more in the future with climate change, also our, our environment will change. And there are, just to give you two examples, what we are doing at the Swiss Federal Office, uh, the Swiss, uh, ETH Zurich, as mainly uh, people know it, uh, maybe I also briefly introduce what I'm doing there. Uh, I'm the executive, of, uh, executive director of the Energy Science Center at ETH Zurich. We connect about 60 professors in the domain of, of energy at our school in Switzerland, and we do uh, a multitude of, of projects, and what our specialty is really the interdisciplinarity, because we bring engineers to talk to economists, we have uh, urban planners talk to, to engineers uh, and everybody together. And we have two big projects I just want to mention, one is called Nexus E, basically what, what it is, is a, it's a modeling tool where we have from the bottom distribution systems all the way up to macroeconomics in one system. So we have the different time resolutions here from minutes when we look at security of the supply to macroeconomics, decades. And at the same time, we have different level of aggregation of the distribution systems, and then we have the overall system. So we are really integrating all these different models into one integrated energy system modeling platform. And the second thing that is really more on the integration of renewables, uh, and it's uh, the hardware, we have a renewable energy management and real-time control platform, how we call it, where we connect together with MPAN PSI, two of our system institutions in CERN, where we connect all different kind of technologies, all different kinds of uh, uh, energy carriers into one real-time measurement and control platform where we can test new algorithms, where we can go in with blockchain or with anything you want, but with real components, but not in, in an actually real system, but in a real life system, I, I would call it, almost real life system. So these are just two examples of what we are doing. And uh, yeah, just to, to repeat myself, I think uh, technology is mainly there. Uh, we have some missing dots, especially in, in storage. Um, we need strong collaborations also across disciplines and across companies. And for this, we need also tools and demonstrators. Thank you. <laughs>